Back in the early 1960s, when the young Gabriel Garcia Marquez was hanging out in Mexico, he was wrestling with his novel. One day, fellow writer Avaro Mutis came to him, gave him a copy of Pedro Paramo and said, read this and learn, goddammit. Marquez had a breakthrough. He said that he has never been touched by a book as much as Pedro Paramo since he has read Kafka's Metamorphosis. The impact that Pedro Paramo had on him and Latin American literature in general can still be felt to this day. But what makes this novel so great? What can we learn from its narrative structure? And why is everything falling apart in this novel? Well, let's take a closer look at this. But before we dig into the meat and bones of the novel, let me give you a quick recap of the plot. But bear in mind that the plot is more a means to an end in this novel. But knowing a bit more about the plot sure helps to understand what the hell I'm talking about later. So there is this guy called Juan Preciado and he travels to a town called Comala to find his father Pedro Paramo. Because that's what his dying mom wanted him to do and being the good son that he is, he obeyed her. Anyway, as he's on his way to Comala, he bumps into this burrow driver named Abundio Martinez, who immediately tells him that his father has been dead for years. But Juan still continues and rolls into town, only to find it deserted. Or is it? Well, apparently the spirits of the long dead locals of this once beautiful and lush town still restlessly roam around. Now this is where the fun begins. Because this is also where the plot breaks up into fragments, shifting between space and time. Juan is still poking around Comala, but we also get a glimpse into the past. And what do we learn there? That Pedro Paramo was a tyrant, or dare I say it, a meanie. But the past also tells us about the undying love between Pedro Paramo and Susana San Juan. And just when you think you're getting the hang of these fragments and find some structure in them, Rulfo gives you the finger by killing off Juan Preciado. Did I just give you a spoiler? No, the story is ruined. Or so you thought. Remember, the story is just a tool here, so don't worry about it. After the midway point, the story then puts more focus on the episodes of Pedro Paramo and Komala in the past, but the fragments all appear to be even more disconnected than before. Feeling a bit lost? Well, this is by design. Why? Well, let me try to explain. So I want to look at two different aspects that make up this novel. First, how Juan Rulfo plays with confusion to break up the story. Then, how he uses metaphors of things breaking apart to underline the fragmented structure of the novel, as well as the ongoing death and despair. We start the novel with what seems to be a clear goal. A son looking for his father as a promise to his dying mother. I came to Comala because I had been told that my father, a man named Pedro Paramo, lived there. It was my mother who told me. And I had promised her that after she died, I would go see him. I squeezed her hands as a sign I would do it. She was near death and I would have promised her anything. So this is something that anybody can understand and follow and sympathize with one way or another. But what does Rulfo then do? He takes Juan Preciado out of this clear go when he visits Comala. Because, well, literally everybody in this town is already dead and so is the town itself. And as Juan starts to roam the town, interacting with the specters of the past, he is just as lost as we are. And just when you think you've got a grip on things, Rufo throws a curveball at you by shifting time. Then you're like, ah yeah, I get it. So every time we are in the past tense, this is a fragment related to the past and every time it is in present tense, that is a fragment to the current timeline in the novel. Well, surely this is it, right? No, because what Rolfo then does is suddenly shifting to other tenses between fragments, leaving you just as bewildered as Juan is. And the bewilderment doesn't stop there. As Juan gets more and more confused about the fact that everybody is dead in this town, so are you as a reader because it subverts your expectations. As I passed the street corner, I saw a woman wrapped in her rebozo. She disappeared as if she had never existed. I started forward again, peering into the doorless houses. Again, the woman in the rebozo crossed in front of me. So it's this interplay between life and death what creates this hazy and confusing vibe in the novel. But the fragmentation of the plot itself is also a device that plays into this. It forces you to engage with the text and constantly reassess what is happening. But in my opinion, this isn't even the full scope of the genius of this novel. What perfects the feeling of confusion we are feeling as a reader is the point in time when Juan dies. That connection you've built with him? Poof, gone. 
Now you suddenly feel completely lost and without a clear goal. Rulfo is a sneaky one, isn't he? In a way, he traps you in Komala just as the Spectres of the Dead are trapped in the crumbling town. And it's not just you, Juan, or the Spectres that are trapped in Komala. Komala itself is trapped in a constant loop between Pedro's rule and Juan showing up in town. So we are constantly moving forwards and backwards in time. And if you already thought that this was breaking your mind, just wait till we get to the metaphors. So it is apparent that Komala is the shadow of its former self. And Juan Rulfo uses a ton of metaphors to enhance this image. Everything in this novel is breaking apart, disintegrating or slowly chipped away by the elements, especially water. What's interesting is how these metaphors often contrast each other. For example, Juan's mom paints Komala as this lush paradise. But right at the start of the novel, we get hit with a contrast. You might say, but this is nothing, my companion replied. Try to take it easy. You'll feel it even more when we get to Komala. The town sits on the coals of the earth at the very mouth of hell. They say that when people from there die and go to hell, they come back for a blanket. Okay, so what's the meaning of this passage? With the expression at the very mouth of hell, we have this heavy contrast between paradise and hell in the perception of Komala. And I think that's pretty metal, but it also sets the stage for the decaying wasteland we are about to enter. Also, Abundio saying to Juan here that he should take it easy gives a sense of foreshadowing of what is about to happen. Because as we already know, Juan is about to step into a town full of dead people where he will bite the dust. The woman's body was made of earth, layered in crusts of earth. It was crumbling, melting into a pool of mud. I felt myself swimming in the sweat streaming from her body and I couldn't get enough air to breathe. I got out of bed. She was sleeping. From her mouth bubbled a sound very like a death rattle. I went outside for air, but I could not escape the heat that followed wherever I went. There was no air. Only the dead still night fired by the dark days of August. Can you feel the dread and anxiety in this passage? Juan literally suffocates because of the woman crumbling and melting beside him and the air outside offers no relief. On the other hand, the crumbling and melting of the woman creates this image of a decaying body. This adds to Juan's confusion. Just moments ago, she wanted him in bed and now she's literally decomposing next to him. It's also pretty gross. I've already been dropping hints how these metaphors connect to the elements. In the last part, we were talking about both earth and water, like stuff crumbling and melting and sweat streaming. And you also see this in the following passage. Water dripping from the roof tiles was forming a hole in the sand of the patio. Plink, plink, and then another plink. As drops struck a bobbing, dancing laurel leaf caught in a crack between the adobe bricks. The storm had passed. Now an intermittent breeze shook the branches of the pomegranate tree, losing showers of heavy rain, spattering the ground with gleaming drops that dulled as they sank into the earth. So what's the deal here? Water is dropping from the roof, drilling holes into the ground. So again, we have this dance between water and earth. And while the image of crumbling is very obvious here, there's another thing it's pointing at. And what might that be? You see, since this passage is the start of the first fragment, which takes us back in time, this can also be interpreted as showing the passage of time. Both the water dripping as well as the sand it is hitting create an image of an hourglass. I hope you understand this. That's why I was talking about these metaphors helping the fragmented structure of the novel. They can act as a transition between space and time. I think that's pretty fascinating. The last passage I want to look at is the very end of the novel. He supported himself on Damiana Cicerno's arm and tried to walk. After a few steps, he fell. Inside, he was begging for help, but no words were audible. He fell to the ground with a thud and lay there, collapsed like a pile of rocks. In this scene, we encounter the moment of Pedro Paramo's death. The part that jumps out is how he collapsed like a pile of rocks. So we have this guy who is the cause of Komala's decay, literally crumbling apart at the moment of his death. It shows how unstable everything in this novel is and how even the main guy, who is literally the title of the novel, simply just fell apart. So what does this all mean? In an essay for the 30th anniversary of the novel, Juan Rulfo wrote, If you want to write, you really have to suffer. And I think this is reflected in this novel because grief and despair constantly persist throughout the novel. Everything is stuck in this constant loop of suffering. If it's Juan Preciado, the specters will still hang out in Komala, Komala itself, 
or the many sons of Pedro Paramo, which by the way also include the Budo driver Abundio Martinez, just a little bit of information that I left out at the beginning. What is also interesting, the people in this novel are not released of their suffering when they die, but are stuck in this eternal limbo in which they just continue to suffer for eternity, which is pretty grim if you ask me. There's also the part that the novel breaks apart itself, I've read that Rolfo originally wrote the novel in chronological order, only to then break it apart and rearrange it in the way that fit the message he wanted to convey best. I'm not entirely sure if this is true, so take this information with a grain of salt, but I found it interesting nonetheless. But why did Rolfo write this novel? Well, this is up to the scholars to decide, obviously. But one popular take that I find also very likely is that this novel reflects the situation in Mexico in the first half of the 20th century. Think about it. With the whole Mexican Revolution, the country's history was a roller coaster, and you can view Pedro Paramo as a kind of extension of that chaos. What do you think? Do you think that Pedro Paramo is a political novel? Or do you think that Juan Rulfo had something else in mind when he was writing this novel? I'd really love to hear your thoughts on this. I can certainly see why this novel was so influential, especially in the Latin American literary scene. Hey, thanks again for watching this video to the end. If you have any questions, concerns or suggestions for future topics on this channel, let me know in the comments. If you've enjoyed this video, feel free to like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. This is the one thing you can do to help me and this channel and I would really appreciate it. Thanks again and until then, keep reading.